assumption that the vacuum is a superfluid is so exciting is that it comes with quantum eddies. Eddies that internally form inside the bulk with very specific sizes. Size 1, size 2, but there's no size in between. So they're quantized. And they're naturally inscribed by the parameters of the superfluid itself. Those eddies may turn out to explain the fundamental particles in matter. Another reason that this superfluid vacuum is so exciting is that a superfluid is in general a fluid. That means that it's made up of parts. Now if we go with this assumption, it can carry us to something very, very interesting. Because one of the biggest mysteries in physics so far has been why do the constants of nature, the constants that inscribe the laws of physics and determine the actual substrate of reality as we know it, why are they what they are? Why don't they have different values? What inscribes those values? Today we're going to talk about that. So, assuming that the vacuum is a fluid, particularly a superfluid, but right now all we have to assume is it's a fluid. This quantizes the metric. What does that mean? Well, it means that in a fluid metric, a metric that's made up of pieces, there's going to be a minimum natural amount of length. To talk about any length less than that isn't to talk about length in that metric in the traditional sense. You transcend the definition of length. Just like when we're talking about our familiar example of gold, if we had so much gold and we tried to break that down, we can cut the gold bar in half and keep cutting that in half and keep cutting it in half. And once we get to a certain point, we can no longer cut the gold in half and still have gold. So we transcend the definition of gold. Sure, we can cut that in half, at least theoretically. And we can have something, but what we have is no longer gold. If space is quantized, we have the same expectation so that we can divide our region of space that we're interested in in half and half and half. We can zoom in more and more. And when we get down to a certain minimum amount, the amount that represents that fundamental quantum of space, we can't divide that anymore and still be talking about space. And this has interesting consequences. First of all, in a quantized metric, there's going to be two minimums automatically inscribed, a minimum amount of distance and a minimum amount of time. Now with those, there's going to come three maximums, but they're associated to these minimums. So in a minimum amount of length and a minimum amount of time, there's going to be a massive amount of energy or mass that can be associated. A massive, uh, maximum contribution or distortion in the metric that can take place. You also have a maximum amount of charge and a maximum amount of temperature that can be related to that small region and amount of time. Why is that important? Well, in physics we have lots of ways of describing our systems. Um, we have lots of units. For example, we have a fortnight, a kilometer, a pound, a degrees Celsius, a gallon. All of these units break up into components that come from five measures only. A measurement of space, a measurement of time, a measurement of mass or energy, since those are equivalent, and a measurement of charge and temperature. With those five measurements, we can describe all the units used in physics. Now, sometimes they're composites, sometimes they have length over time, um, so distance over time, and that would be a velocity. But in every single case in physics, every unit we use can be constructed by those five units. Okay, so these five units are fundamental. We need to un just understand them in order to figure out everything that follows in our map. But if we're quantizing the map, we're quantizing these base units. So, will that tell us anything about where the constants of nature come from? Now, if you're new to the topic of con uh, constants of nature, you might be a little bit confused about what I mean. So I want to make it very clear. The constants of nature are the physics constants that I'm talking about. So the speed of light, Planck's constant, the gravitational constant, the fine structure constant, or elementary charge, Boltzmann's constant, the magnetic constant, the electric constant, Coulomb's constant, the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, all the way down to the Faraday constant to the molar gas constant. There's lots and lots. I only told you a few of them, but these are some of the most popular that you may have heard of before. Now, the question we're going to try to answer is, why do they have the exact values that they have? 
Is there anything that inscribes them? Or are, as this, some physics theories currently postulate, are they randomly inscribed? Is there an infinite number of universes out there and they all have random different values for each constant and we just happen to be in this universe because this arrangement allows life to evolve and therefore we're here to ask the question. Now I think that's a rather empty answer and that's why I'm excited to talk about this because it turns out that when we quantize the map, when we have a minimum amount of length, a minimum amount of time, and a maximum amount of mass, charge, and temperature that are associated with those minimums, then those five Planck values Okay, we're going to associate them with the, the quantum mechanics expectation that they're going to be uh, lined up with the Planck values, become natural units in our map. So the Planck length is our minimum amount of distance that you can talk about or reference in our map. But the Planck length equals one natural unit of length in the map. The Planck time is one natural unit of time and so on. Okay, now if we've quantized our map, we've broken it up into a bunch of pieces, and all those pieces can be arranged in different ways. But, just like the gas in this room, on average they're going to have the same density. So when you zoom out, the arrangements tend to be the same over here as they are over here. Okay, but there's one characteristic we haven't inscribed. If the arrangements are the same, if the density doesn't change, we can characterize that zero change in density, or zero curvature, several different ways. Since we're going to stick to a geometric explanation, let's do it this way. We can take a circle and draw the circle in our metric. And all the, the number of quanta that line up on the circumference of that circle, we can add those up. And then we can take the diameter any way you want and add the number of quanta that, that fill out the diameter. Now if you divide those two ratios, you're going to get a value that approximates pi. So 3.14159, on and on. And the more macroscopic your system is, the more um, it represents Euclidean geometry, or approximates it, the more accurate that ratio is going to be equal to pi. Okay, so pi in this case represents a zero curvature in our map. We have the five Planck constants that represent the quantization, but that quantization gives us room for changes in curvature, changes in density from one region to another. So the minimum change is zero change. And that zero change is now encoded geometrically by the number pi. It has no dimensions with it, it's just a number. Now, we need another number that can encode the maximum curvature, the maximum change in density from one region in the vacuum to another region. Now, of course, we expect this to occur somewhere around a black hole. Okay, well, we don't know what the exact value is going to be. We need to derive that independently. But if our assumption that space that the vacuum itself is a superfluid is correct, then we expect the curvature value, the maximum change in curvature or maximum change in density from one region to the next, that value can be represented geometrically in exactly the same way. In fact, we have to reference it the same way in order for the comparison to be equal. So now imagine inscribing a region where there's a black hole in the middle. What does this mean in our model? It means that in the center of our diagram, all the quanta are pushed together. Space is really, really dense. And den the density gets less and less as you go out from that. Now we've, we've drawn a circle around it. So we, we can add up the circumference, the number of quanta that fill out the circumference and get a value. But when we add up the number of quanta that go through the middle, since the density increases in the middle, the number of quanta will be much higher than what we would need to get our, our ratio of circumference over diameter to be equal to pi. And because the diameter, the denominator in our ratio, is much higher, the ratio itself goes to much smaller. Now, the smallest it could be would be zero, but that would require the diameter to be infinite. And because we've quantized the map, we can't have an infinite number of quanta in there, no matter how large of a circle we started with. So long as it was finite, the diameter has to all be finite, even with maximum curvature. Now this is an interesting departure from general relativity. In general relativity, it's assumed that you could have an infinite amount of space inside. Quantum mechanics contradicts that, so the two pictures have uh, different expectations. But in our model, we're clearly siding with quantum mechanics um, on this particular issue and saying that the, the diameter itself cannot be infinite. Therefore, we have some number that has to be between zero and pi. 
and we expect it to be much closer to zero than we do to pi. So let's say between zero and one. There should be one dimensionless number between zero and one. When combined with pi and the five Planck constants, this should give us, this should inscribe naturally all the constants of nature. Okay, that's what our model assumes. The, the slippery part, of course, is that we don't know the exact value of this number. Let's call it je, so we have something to reference it with. Okay, so we have the acrylic letter je representing some number between 0 and 1. We have pi, 3.14159265353, so on, so on. And we have the five Planck constants. So the Planck length, just in case this is all new, is 1.616 times 10 to the negative 35 meters. The Planck time is 5.39 times 10 to the negative 44 seconds, really, really short. The Planck mass is 2.176 times 10 to the negative 8 kilograms. Now remember, that's a maximum associated with the minimum amount of length and time. The Planck charge is 1.875 times 10 to the negative 18 coulombs. And the Planck temperature is 1.416 times 10 to the positive 32 Kelvin. Really high temperature. In fact, this is thought to be the temperature of the entire universe at the first moment after the Big Bang. Okay, we have those five limits inscribed automatically by the geometric claim that the vacuum itself is quantized, added with the assumption that those limits themselves will match up with the expectations of one mechanics. So we have values in our arbitrary units today, um, the standard units like meters, kilograms, seconds, um, coulombs, and kelvin. Okay, but I want you to remember that those are arbitrary units that we've made and we've, we've made our standard in science, but in nature, they are not natural. In na nature, the only natural units are one Planck length, one Planck time, one Planck mass, one Planck charge, and one Planck temperature. Those are all the natural units. And the geometric parameters that encode the minimum amount of curvature, pi, and the maximum amount of curvature, j. Okay, if the map is quantized like we're assuming, then those should be the seven parameters that encode all of that geometry, that give us the, the, the limits of that geometry. So, if the geometry happens to be responsible for the constants of nature, for the values that they actually have, then those seven numbers should automatically lead to all the constants of nature. Do they? Is there any way we can complete that pattern? Well, it turns out that there is a number for je that perfectly matches this pattern. If je is equal to 0 0.08542454431, and on and on, a repeating decimal, then we have a natural pattern that automatically links all the constants of nature. So you can go to my website and you can pull up the constants of nature section um, under the What is Quantum Space Theory tab. And you can scroll down and see all the constants of nature. But we can start with some of the simple ones here. The speed of light becomes naturally one Planck length over one Planck time. Exactly. There's not a strange constant out in front of it to 1.374 times by that ratio. It's exactly just that ratio. It's the natural unit of length divided by the natural unit of time gives the natural maximum speed. Okay, the gravitational constant is the Planck length cubed divided by the Planck mass and the Planck time squared. The fine structure constant becomes identical to je squared. That makes the elementary charge just je times the Planck charge. Okay, the Boltzmann constant, we can continue down the list, but you can go to the website and check them all out. But the Boltzmann constant is just the Planck length squared times by the Planck mass, all divided by the Planck time squared and the Planck temperature. Okay. If you go down further, you're going to see that some numbers depend on pi, sometimes pi squared, um, and some numbers depend on je, sometimes je squared, I think even one to the fourth. Um, so, but all of these constants don't have any strange arbitrary values out in front of them. They're determined directly by the geometric parameters that we expect from our map. So, Today's short little lesson should get you excited about the possibility that the vacuum itself is a superfluid. Um, we still have work to do with this. We need to derive 
the value of a je, the one that um, allows this pattern to be completed, we need to independently derive that from superfluid expectations. Um, anyone who's interested in working with me on that, give me a contact. Thank you.